All right, everybody. So welcome back to the channel. Uh, this is the uh, the personal channel, personal channel here. This is someone who I've done talk shows and it, audios, whatever you want to call it, for years now. This is a colleague. We go all the way back to school. He's my predecessor at The Signal, uh, which is the student paper at Georgia State. Everybody welcome in Mr. Akeem Balaam. Akeem, how are you doing today, man? I am absolutely tremendous. <laughs> I'm just, as I say all the time, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be on Shah's level. That's the thing. Like I'm absolutely tremendous. Um, for those that probably don't know who I am yet, uh, I write at beyondthew.com. I also write for Queen Ballers uh, and for Prep Girls Hoops uh, South Carolina site. Uh, we just wrapped up our state playoffs, and I was literally crisscrossing the Palmetto State, going from game to game to game. We just had our, our state championships at Aiken um, at the Convocation Center in Aiken. So I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I had to, you know, kind of recharge my bat battery after that. I'm about to hit the road again for, um, you know, doing the travel schedule. But, um, but yeah, that's a little bit about me. But, um, but yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm living. I'm obtaining and maintaining. In short, Akeem is on here because he knows more about women's basketball than I do. So <laughs> we, we, we had to get on the you expert. We that? had to get on the expert. Yeah, I know. For sure. For sure. You say you're trying to get like me. I'm trying to get like Keem on the women's basketball. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, man. Hey, if you are new to the mm. channel, this is the Road to 2K subs. As always, without further ado, man, I'm not even going to waste any more of y'all's time. But let's go. I'm about to share the bracket. Screen. Uh, my bracket has taken so many hits this year, King, and mm. oh my goodness, another hit today, cooked, cooked, with this mm. Oregon and uh, where are we at, Georgia, Oregon and mm -hmm. Georgia game, once uh -huh. again, another loss for me, I had Arkansas going all the way to the dang Elite Eight, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. it's, my bracket's cooked, man, how, how are you looking, Have you, did you fill out a bracket, I guess that's a better question. Oh, I fill one out. I had um, uh, I fill one out. I had in my um, in my final four. I had um, Stanford, UConn, Texas, and Texas A and M. So I'm still kind of, sort of, maybe looking good as far as as far as a, as far as a bracket is concerned, as far as the the standing in my final four. But I think that you know, like you said, like the 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 right state upset. And then you had, you know, a couple of other games, obviously, that, you know, that ended up in upsets as well. I think everybody's, I think everybody's bracket at this point on the women's side is looking, uh, is looking like molasses, especially after that second day. Because the thing about it is the first day of the tournament, the first day, it was all chalk. You know, it was all chalk, you know, even though I did, you know, I know that one of the, one of the upsets that you also picked was Stephen F. Austin. And Georgia Tech, <laughs> yeah, I know yeah. you picked that one. The biased and, one. Yeah, exactly. But but that was a good upset to pick, though, because Stephen F. Austin's one of those teams that one way or another you think is going to give you at least one upset for sure, because they're always in the Cinderella conversation. But um, <laughs> but yeah, that's one of those um, that's one of those uh, those games that I think was certainly a, a pick. But um, but overall, I'm still kind of sort of looking good, but it's still one of those things where I'm still um, thinking about, OK, which one of these teams is going to be eliminated first? Because the reason as to why I went with Texas and Texas A&M, two reasons. Number one, I think that because of the fact that this is like, you know, this is going to be um, basically Charlie Carlier's. Um, audition tape for before she gets drafted first by Dallas into the WNBA, I think she's going to ball out. That's number one. And number two, because of the fact that the women's tournament is entirely in a bubble in San Antonio, I kind of sort of thought that maybe that would favor the Texas-based teams, like your Texas A&M, which won a national championship in 2010, like your Baylor, which won the last you know, the last um, national championship that we had before last year's got canceled because of Corona. And then you got Texas who has Charlie Collier. So I thought that that would probably sort of kind of maybe favor the Texas team. So I went pretty big on Texas this year on Lone Star State teams, even though my final is two teams not from Texas, East meets West with Syracuse, with uh, UConn and Stanford. So, um, so I kind of, you know, went in that direction even though I had Stanford beating UConn. Keem is looking tough for you right now, bro. <laughs> I <mean, yeah, laughs> Iowa State up nine right now as we're recording this in the third quarter. 
Oh no! Really? <laughs> what? <laughs> and then, okay, so another oh, question no. I have for you. Another question I have for you. Mm. Charlie Collier advances. Maryland been blowing teams out. Maryland and Baylor, both of them jokers, been blowing teams out. Like they playing rec league. I don't mm. know what the heck going on, but yeah, that's what's going on right now with those two teams. Mm. Angel Reese, Charlie Collier down there in the post, five versus five. You have Charlie Collier coming out on top in that matchup. That the, I do. Question that mark. I do. <laughs> Why? Why? Yeah. I don't know. Like I said, I think it's I think it's just because of, you know, because of the whole thing. Like, you know, because you just never know. These these brackets and this this is an entirely different tournament because it's being held in an in, in entirely central location. So travel isn't the factor that it typically would be in this tournament, in, in, in a typical tournament, even though I see exactly what you're saying on Maryland, because look at what Maryland just did to Mount. Look at what Maryland just did to Bama. I mean, um, like they, they just put up a century spot. Like I'm, I'm sticking with my pick. I'm sticking with my four. I'm sticking with Texas. I ain't going off of my bracket, but I see what you mean. Maryland is looking scary. I mean, Maryland's one of those teams. They're one of the top women's teams in the country. And, you know, they have a history of, you know, obviously, you know, of attracting top talent. The way Maryland is looking, Maryland is looking like maybe one of those teams that probably peaks around this time. And maybe you just do not want to play them. So I see what you mean. Maryland's looking kind of, Maryland is, they're looking kind of tough. But at the same time, you also have to take it into consideration. Tournaments in these tournaments, you know, they're one because a lot of times it ends up being close. And what do you want in these close games? You want free throw shooting and you want defense. So for now, I'm still sticking with Texas, but I see what you're talking about with Maryland because woo, they are, after, after that century mark they put on Alabama, <laughs> it even got me excited kind of thinking. Yeah, all them jokers are big too, man. All them jokers are big, like the from the guards. You know, everybody's talking about the Wusu's performance today is what I'm kind of seeing on the timeline, and uh, you know, obviously Diamond and stuff like that in the backcourt. So, so they have some big guards, but I think also an edge. Well, it's slight edge, just one thing. Uh, a Mississippi State reunion right there with uh, Chloe and, uh, and you know, uh, Coach Vic. So that that'll be interesting to kind of see, like. If, you know, he's like, oh, I, I, at least one player I have a scouting report on. I know it is every single one of our, I've been watching that in practice <laughs> the last three or so years. But yeah, man, um, our uh, A&M still down by about nine. So they're hovering around before the final period. It'll, it'll be interesting to see what they had there. For me, mm -hmm. I could use an Iowa State win because I had A&M getting upset in the first round. And I just missed that one. Look at mm -hmm. this. Look at this. Oh, I just missed that one. Oh. Uh, that Troy almost got Troy almost got an upset. Troy almost got it, and apparently there was a um, a, a controversial call in that game too, like late in the game, with like right out of bounds thing or something like that. So yeah, which yeah. should have I, been a which should have been a backcourt violation. Backcourt, it was backcourt. It's a backcourt violation. See, this is why I have Keem on here. This is why I have <laughs> Keem on here <laughs> to get me right on these things. But but yeah, but yeah, I, I have Maryland going all the way. Maryland and UConn, and then UConn winning in the the final. But um, mm. man, let, let's. Oh, go go ahead, go ahead. No, I was, I was about to say, like those, you know, those are pretty good picks as well. I mean, especially like I said, you know, lots of people that probably were, you know, probably were sleeping on Maryland. Like I said, they're looking at that offense and they're looking at, you know, how many points they are just putting up, just blowing out teams out of the water. Like you said, they're probably thinking, okay, maybe do I want to rethink my bracket right about now? I think, I think um, you know, b before we get to the big game that we're going to talk about at the end here, um, skipping forward, assuming that UConn comes out on top, which, you know, I think both of us probably on the same page of that. UConn and Baylor, that's going to be a very interesting one because, you know, while UConn is making it look extremely easy, Baylor is making it look ridiculously. Like, we were talking about Maryland. Baylor is kind of like – if, I think they're right here, and Baylor's kind of like an edge on them of the best, the team that's playing the best right now in the bubble. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, just, just, you know, how are you feeling about kind of that matchup, that Elite Eight matchup with Baylor and, and uh, UConn? Oh, um, that, you know, I, I, like, I feel like in many ways I, all, I have 
sort of no choice but to but to kind of stick with UConn just for the sake of my bracket. But it's one of those it's one of those issues where, like I said, like the the Baylor thing. One thing I will say about the Baylor thing is that they are the they are I guess considered the defending champions because they won in 2019. So one thing you know that's one thing that I think one can say is that Baylor you know somebody can say that they have somewhat of an experience and a recency edge maybe over UConn because the last few years UConn has you know gotten close. I mean you know, they've gotten to final fours, but when you're a UConn team, you know, and, you know, everybody talks about, of course, they got Beckers and they got, you know, you know, who, who they got on, on UConn, but it's one of those issues where when you're, you know, sometimes experience can really be a determining factor in a lot of these games. And that's one thing that you can say at the very least about Baylor is that they are battle tested and that they are battle tested recently. They've won championships. But one thing about UConn is that, you know, it's one of those issues where sometimes you have a team like a UConn that can be pretty dang on hungry to get back to the top and sort of reclaim your, your place up atop that perch of women's basketball. So I think that'll be, that'll be a very interesting game. And, you know, I, I'm still, like I said, I'm still sticking with UConn, but at the same time, like if, if, there's, a, if there's a game, if there's a game, given how the tournament has gone, where we could possibly see maybe, and even though it wouldn't be considered an upset upset, you know, because it would be a two versus a one. But if that's a game that I would have circled on my calendar, it probably would be Baylor. Because Baylor, like you said, is another one of those teams, they think can repeat. They clearly think and repeat. And they could very, like I said, they could very well do it. We'll see. Uh, I wonder if there's a part of uh, Gino who wishes maybe he would have, uh had to stay out one more game, you know, just for that emotional boost. Cause they're going to have an emotional boost in that, in that Iowa game, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, is emotional boosts don't last for a game and a half, you know, two games, you know, if it's something like that. So uh -huh. I, a part of me wonders if someone like sick in the head like that, cause you know, coaches who win that much are just sick in the head. Like you think of a saving and a, et cetera, et cetera. Like those coaches are sick in the head. So, a yeah. part of me wonders if Gino would have preferred to, like, wait one more round. But this is the biggest game of the tournament just as far as, you know, attention and, you know, uh, how special it is for the sport. Um, but before we get to that, last thing I want to get to uh, before we get to that, like I said, um, should we talk about Louisville? Mm, I don't really want to talk about Louisville. I, 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 I guess we, we could touch on Louisville. Go, go ahead and uh, say your piece about Louisville. Oh, man, like – I was just thinking about this. I was just thinking about this a little bit earlier because Louisville Northwestern, I mean, that is, I mean, uh, and, and everybody talks about like how great of a player Dana Evans is. And she's definitely one of the best players in the country. So props to Louisville for pulling this out. But if you're Northwestern, that has to be like, there, there are ways to lose a game, especially in a tournament. You could get blown out. You could absolutely get blown out. Ask High Point. Ask anybody who Baylor and Maryland have played up to this point. Like, you could get blown out. You could be right up there, you know, right there to the end in a close one, like, you know, like UGA was with Oregon. Then you could be in a position similar to what Northwestern was in. 18-point lead on Louisville. Like, upset waiting to happen and then you let louisville back in the game and then all of a sudden they just break your heart late i mean like if 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 i'm northwestern or if i'm a player on any team i would much rather lose one of those first two ways rather than lose the way that northwestern lost because that's the type of loss as ask any athlete that's the type of loss in any sport that just leaves a sour taste in your mouth. Like that's a taste in your mouth that, you know, you're not going to be able to get like, that's a game you're going to be thinking about all off season. If you're one of those, if you're one of those Northwestern players, especially if you're returning for Northwestern. So that mm, man, like, I, I don't know what, I don't even know what more to say. That's a, that's a heartbreaking way to lose a game. And see, the thing is that could have been a situation where as I was thinking about earlier, that could have been a situation earlier 
where we could have been talking about Chicago as Cinderella City. Because you got Loyola once again on the men's side, you got Northwestern just north of just north of the loop on the women's side. Like we could have been talking about like that. That's just one of those games that's just thinking like, oh my gosh, we had in the bag, man. Mm. That, that that that's a really. I didn't know they lost like that. I didn't know they lost like that. And uh, Northwestern, I really like their backcourt with the defensive player of the year and uh, and Lindsey Lindsey Pulliam. Uh, I kind of just like that that duo there. Like that point guard is real tough. Number twelve, I, mm -hmm. I forgot her name. It slipped my mind right now. But right. eighteen, and they lost. They, they lost by nine. Like they almost lost by double digits. Like that's just like you said. That's that's crushing, especially in a single elimination setting. But um, right. you know, I guess. Uh, oh, oh, with, with Louisville, um, Louisville. Excuse me. <laughs> we go Louisville. <laughs> yeah, Louisville. You can tell where I'm from. I'm not from there. But uh, <laughs> you know, do, do you? I have them going to the Final Four. Um, they're right now. They have Oregon, and then after that, they have the winner of where? Where do I have Stanford here? Where do I have Stanford losing here? Oh hmm. my gosh! I had Stanford losing to Arkansas. Wow. Oh yeah, that's dumb, right. Dumb, yeah. dumb. <laughs> I had Arkansas going all the way, man. You had Arkansas. It's kind of like that, that, um, that sort of, I guess you could say, semi Cinderella. Yeah, semi Cinderella of like the the mid seed who, you know, they mm -hmm. beat UConn, so they're tough like that. And the SEC is different in the SEC. And all the <laughs> SEC teams let me more. down. Tennessee, you let me down. UGA, you let me down. All right, uh, Arkansas, <laughs> let me. You, I don't want to hear anything else about. SEC, the UConn on because UConn's still playing and the SEC is sitting at home. So I don't want to hear uh, Kentucky. I, I didn't pick them to go that far. I, I picked them to lose to Iowa, but yeah, yeah I don't want to hear Especially anything else about Tennessee. the SEC anymore. Tennessee. Especially Tennessee. Yeah, Tennessee was the one. I'm sorry. I, I kind of had to call out Tennessee because I think that there are lots of people, I think, this year that were kind of a little bit high on Tennessee. I mean, you know, Tennessee is another one of those blue blood programs. But, but Tennessee, you want to talk about a team that just let everybody down, definitely let me down because I had them going far. But Tennessee, like, like I said, that was mm, getting, getting bounced in the second round the way, the way that they did. And, you know, even the game that they played, that their opening round game that they played against Middle Tennessee. I mean, even that was, you know, that yeah, was, that was the, and in the first half, that was, you were looking at it like Anastasia is going to get her revenge here. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but I only had them going to the lead eight. I had them losing to Baylor. Uh, uh -huh. So hopefully Nas Shulman does what she does best and, you know, has a great game as they lose to Baylor. And uh, my bracket will still be intact. <laughs> but uh <laughs> the D. Richards story, by the way, of a Baylor. That's that's one oh, of those yeah, that's yeah, one of those right. very, very, very inspiring stories. For for sure, for sure. So to get back up and walking and uh you know, getting back to playing shape and starting shape by, by the beginning of the tournament, start of the tournament, playing at high level is a great story for for her. Shout out to her with those. But she reminds me of my little sister, like when she was a baby, because my little sister, when she was a baby, had the Afro puffs. So, like, that's who she mm. reminds me of. <laughs> <laughs> well, whenever I see her out there on the court, I think of my little sister as a baby. Shout out to my little sister. Nice. But, yeah, I think, uh, I, yeah, I love that story. And I also love the, the, the Tiana uh, Manakia story out of Syracuse. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw her um, crying on the podium last night. What, what was that about? Uh, tell, tell me a little bit more about her story, King, please. Um, well, yeah, she, um, well, she's a, um, she is, I, I had to, you know, kind of, you know, get the, um, you know, uh, sort of get the story right and make sure I'm not messing anything up. I know one thing for sure is, you know, she is, um, she's projected to be a, uh, a top, you know, draft pick, you know, when the, um, you know, when the WNBA draft, you know, takes place, um, you know, next month. But, um, but yeah, you know, she, um, she overcame a uh, stage two breast cancer, which included eight rounds of chemo and a double mastectomy. And she missed all of last season. She missed all of last season going through everything that she had gone through. And for her to battle back the way that she did, like, you know, you want to talk about inspiring stories, like props, props to her, props to her, like, you know, uh, I, I just can't wait to see her, you know, get drafted because that's a, uh, you know, she, you know, she's one of those players that for sure you just, you know, you just can't help but root for, for you know, 
from her story and everything that she has been through. You know, shout out to shout out to Tia, Tiana Manakia, you know, and, uh, you know, because, you know, that is that's a great story. Shout out to her for sure, man. Like that, that is an amazing story. Like, like you said, I had no idea because, you know, I was watching, you know, the, the highlights last night and um, I was like, I was shouting her out. I was like, oh, she's tough. She, she got some nice moves in there, you know, thing. Uh, her and I like the big from Syracuse too. Those two players, I, I like those the best um, from um, Syracuse. But but I had yeah, no idea, like you said, uh, projected uh, top pick in, in the draft. Mm -hmm. So so we shall first see. First rounder. That. Yeah yeah, first rounder. So so we shall see what happens next month in the draft. But wow, that is that's simply incredible. You know, definitely got to get it up. Got to got to get it up. Oh yeah, absolutely. All right. All right all right all right. We now that we got all that out the way, I'm gonna let that breathe a little bit. This is what the people have come for, King. This is what the people have come for. All right, we're going to start with talking about Iowa and UK because that was the first mini appetizer of big names, former USA uh, teammates, Ryan Howard and, uh, and Caitlin Clark. First of all, how, how did you feel about that performance? Uh, if you got to catch up with the highlights or watch the game or anything like that. That performance, like, like I, I – like – you know, and, and, you know, taking nothing away from Ryan Howard. I mean, she ended up with, with 28 points. But Caitlin Clark, like, I feel like the, this is, this is you know, within the women's basketball community, like, people have been really ranting and raving about Caitlin Clark. And, you know, I felt like this was one of those players that we wanted to see, like, okay, she's a freshman. So, you know, going into the tournament is an entirely different animal than, you know, playing either, you know, a season – or playing within one's conference. But Caitlin Clark, in the first couple of games that she has played, particularly that game against Kentucky, has looked like a cheat code. I mean, it's so amazing. And this is, like I said, this is, you know, this is really, like, if people did not know who Caitlin Clark is before this tournament, oh, they know who she is now. Because if I remember correctly, I forgot her stat line, but I believe she had. 30 some 35 points I believe like yeah, 35 at, 35 35 points and at half at halftime of that game against Kentucky Kentucky as a team had 22 Caitlin Clark had 24 by herself I mean you want to talk about like crazy. she's crazy man she's crazy yeah I mean she's one of those players that is that is all of a sudden rekindling a debate on if freshmen should be allowed to go into the WNBA draft because you just and 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 not only that like she can score from anywhere on the floor can shoot threes can mid-range like can hit her free throws is a very very proficient passer I mean you know for you know and, and this is you know on an Iowa team that is starting to have a history of sending, you know, of sending players to the league. I mean, Megan Gustafson came out of Iowa. So, I mean, this is, you know, I, I, I felt that the game between Iowa and Kentucky would be a little bit closer because I know everybody was thinking, okay, you know, Caitlin Clark, Ryan Howard. But, but you know, the way that it turned out, like, don't let that final score of 86-72, don't let that fool you. Because for much of the game, it was a blowout. So I was just thinking, like, wow, like this is Caitlin Clark is a walking cheat code, like for real. Yeah, yeah, and and, and that was the thing I, I said, and I, I did the reaction, but um, you know, copyright stuff, like the sound was taken off, so I just took it off. Uh, I put it on private, anyways. But like what I was saying, and and there was just, it's like you know, like you said, throughout the season the women's basketball community knew what Caitlin Clark was about. On the outside world, it was literally, they were just hearing about Paige and maybe like Zaya Cook every now and again in South Carolina because, you know, people love Don Staley. But inside, everybody knew about Caitlin Clark. So it was kind of like, this is her Steph Curry moment to me, in my opinion, of like Steph back in 08. Everybody in Davidson and SoCon, whatever conference Davidson was in in uh, 2008, they knew about Steph Curry and who Steph Curry was. The world didn't know about Steph Curry until he got on that stage in March Madness and did what he did. You look at Caitlin's page right now, you go to her Twitter, you refresh, just keep refreshing it. <laughs> she is gone from, I think she went from like, a, like the first time I, I clicked at something that someone tagged her in, 
she had like 4,000 followers. And then like, I looked at it again, like er later when somebody else tagged her or something and she has 7,000, over 7,000 now. And I saw on Instagram, KD shouted her out and all these celebrities are talking about her Sue Bird, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just like, she's been like this. Like, <laughs> she's been doing yeah. it all year. But, but, but it's just nice to see her finally, like you said, have that coming out party. And then on the side of Ryan Howard, Ryan Howard, um, I said this in the thing, very disappointing performance, man. Very disappointing performance. Like you said, she came out with 28 points, but a couple of those buckets were garbage time threes, back-to-back -back threes in the final 30 seconds when the game was already in hand. So, you know, you take that away, that's 22 points, okay? Mm -hmm. And then by about midway through the third quarter, she was shooting three of 12. You got to do better than that, right? You're supposed to be the number one pick. You go back. We go back to talking about um, Texas and Charlie Collier. You say you got Charlie Collier making a run because she's the number one pick. Next year's number one pick is Ryan. So if you're next year's number one pick, you got to do better than that in an elimination game. And that takes me back to West, West Virginia. West Virginia let me down because, you know, I'm hating. I'm hating, uh, and I pick S SFA to upset uh, Tech. So now it's up to West Virginia to keep doing what they got to do to keep my bracket somewhat respectable, okay? And then Kaja Gondrzejic, she has a great game, right? Right? She affects the game in other different ways. Had a great pass, you know what I'm saying? Had a great move, uh, but it was her only bucket. The great move for the bucket, that was her right. only bucket. She had three points as a senior. You're trying to get drafted. You're trying to go to the league. You can't do that in an elimination game, Kaja. So I'm calling right. uh, Kaja out on that as well. Mm -hmm. Kaiser and then Ryan over here. I'm calling out everybody. Ryan from Tennessee, uh, uh, Raina Davis, excuse me. I'm talking about Rania Ryan Davis, yeah. Uh, Rania Davis, Rania Davis. Uh, I, I think it's either it's either Rania or, or I, I forgot the, the actual pronunciation. Okay, okay, because I, I was watching a broadcast because I was calling her like uh, Rania and then like the broadcast was saying Rania, so I, I just been saying Rania since then. We but, just um, go with Rania, okay, okay. We're, we're just gonna roll with Rania, but Rania Davis. I like 12 points. It's an eliminated thing. You're about to go to the league. You're supposed to be, you're trying to be a top five pick. In an elimination game, you got to give me more than 12 points. Okay, mm -hmm. so now back to Ryan. So her 28 points, okay, it was 28 with an asterisk because if you actually watched it, she was just struggling. You, you got to step up for your team. You got to be more aggressive. You got to be selfish in times like that because your team's back is on against, against the wall. And Caitlin, she stepped up to the, uh, to the uh, challenge in both games, both first games. She's averaging 29 right now in the, in the tournament. Ridiculous. And here mm -hmm. we go. Here we go. Hey, give it up one more time, Keaton. Give, give mm -hmm. it up one more time, Keaton. Absolutely. <laughs> here we go. So like I said, if you don't know anything else about women's basketball, you know about this one player because she's been famous since she was about two. Paige Beckers, man. Mm -hmm. Paige Beckers, man. Crazy. Day. <laughs> the whole nine, she's an absolutely outstanding player. Caitlin versus Paige, when you ask who's a better player right now, I'm going to say Paige. There's a reason why Paige is Paige, and there's a reason why Caitlin is Caitlin. Um, you talk about defense. There's been a lot of times during the season where you catch Caitlin with her hands down. Her hands have been up. Her hands have been up. Her hands have been up. This tournament, yeah. I've been watching. I've been watching this stuff. But, you know, for the most part, she's just been lazy on the defensive side of the ball. But she stepped it up in the tournament from what I've seen so far. And that's really kind of the big separation thing. And then the fact that um, Paige is so efficient. Paige is so efficient. Caitlin shoots a lot. Shooters shoot. Shooters shoot to get hot. And shooters uh, shoot when they get hot to stay hot. So, you know, that's, that's kind of Caitlin's thing. But Paige, Paige can get you 24, 20 points, 20 plus points on eight shots. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Paige is just like her efficiency is crazy. And her ability to make her teammates better. Um, shouts out to Iowa as well. Like, like I I'll always say with McKenna Warnock and um, a big, mm -hmm. they got Monica uh, as well. Um, both of those players, they, those are formidable players. Uh, they got a great lineup with Gabby Marshall as well. Uh, they, they, uh, and Kate Martin. So, so they, they have a good lineup or whatever. They have a good nucleus. UConn has all the superstars. But at the beginning of the season, someone commented this. I, I forgot who it was, but shouts out to you. Um, of at the beginning of the season, I wasn't sure if UConn was going to make the Final Four because that's how kind of just um, I don't know what the word would be. I don't know if it'll be inadequate, but that's how kind of not good. They didn't look very good at the beginning of the season. It's kind of like mm -hmm. Paige was carrying them. They were blowing out teams. 
but excuse me. They were winning a lot of games because of Page. They were winning a lot of games because of Page. And once they got down to the SEC, they said, see the SEC, you get tough, huh? (laughs) All y'all let me down. All y'all talked all that trash about the SEC. I I bought into it, did it with my bracket, and all y'all jokers let me down. So I don't want to hear it next season. I'm not listening to y'all anymore. But, um, (laughs) right, you know, they, they go through that rough patch, lose at Arkansas, almost lose in Tennessee. And then, you know, uh, game goes down to the wire again against South Carolina. And I'm like, man, it's looking like Paige, Paige hit big shots in both of those games for them to win. You know, uh-huh. she wasn't playing well in uh, both of those games. She played well on the Arkansas loss, but she wasn't playing well in both of those wins. Well, South Carolina, she played well. Uh, <laughs> there was only one game she didn't play well, and that was the right. Tennessee game. And she hit the biggest shot. So it was just like um, I was just very concerned about them. Olivia looked like she was underperforming. Uh, Chris Ten, uh, she she looked like she was underperforming. Uh, she went through a slump middle of the season, and you're like, "This is you supposed to be a number one player too? Like, what is y'all doing?" Uh, mm-hmm. You know, uh, Anna Anna goes down uh, in the middle of the season, and then uh, uh, Nikki Nikki steps up in her place. And the first time I'm seeing her is that Arkansas game. She gets the ball. And she don't know what to do with it. Like, she don't never held a basketball in her life in the final two minutes. And that was a turnover, you know what I'm saying, or a bad mm-hmm. shot or whatever. So I always think back to that play when I think about her growth. But she's grown so much since then. I'm shouting out Nikki. I always say this. And uh, Nikki now looks like a formidable college player. And then she went out with the injury. So now uh-huh. I'm worried again. Yeah. Once Damn. again. What are your thoughts about uh, Connecticut? What are your thoughts about Paige? And uh, what are you looking at in this matchup? Oh, um, you know, well, you know, the, well, the thing is, I think that this is really a special matchup because, you know, lots of times, you know, in, you know, lots of times in, especially in big tournaments like this, lots of times when you highlight players, Lots of times you're, you're highlighting maybe two juniors or maybe you're highlighting a senior and a junior or maybe you're highlighting two seniors that are, you know, on the verge of being drafted. But it is very, very, very rare that you have an opportunity to really highlight two superstar freshmen. I mean, we're talking about like, you know, two players. You know, obviously there was so much hype around Paige Beckers. And now, because of Caitlin Clark's coming out party, you know, in this tournament, now all of a sudden everybody knows who she is. So, you know, with, like I was saying, within the women's basketball community, this was one of those matchups that I think people was kind of, I think people was kind of putting, you know, this sort of matchup like on their brackets because it was just something that you just wanted to see. Just like, Iowa and Kentucky was a matchup that you just had to see because of Caitlin Clark and Ryan Howard, who, like you said, is going to be the next year's number one overall into the W. Like, this is really a special matchup because, you know, this is one of those, you know, this is one of those, one of those games that now people are going to be thinking, okay, you know, we want to see this year in and year out. And it's, I feel like it's also great for Iowa as a program. Because Iowa, as I was saying earlier, is one of those is one of those schools that, as far as women's basketball, gets overlooked. When you talk about like the landscape of of women's basketball at the college level, you talk about UConn, you talk about Stanford, you talk about South Carolina, you talk about Louisville, you talk about Texas A and M, you talk about so many of these great schools, Baylor. You talk State. about a lot, so many. Right, exactly. You talk about so many of these so many of these schools, but you know, Iowa is one of those schools that kind of, that kind of sort of maybe gets overlooked. Maybe it's because, you know, they're in the, you know, they're in the middle of the country. Maybe it's because maybe they don't necessarily, you know, have the, the recent history of some of these other schools. But, and and by, by the way, they went to yeah. the Elite Eight in um, 2019. I didn't even know that until I was watching a Caitlin interview the other day and I was like, they went to the mm-hmm. Elite Eight a couple years ago? But continue. <laughs> exactly. People forget that. You know, people forget that. And, you know, people still, you know, they, they still kind of remember because, as you know, like I was mentioning, um, Megan, Guff, Megan Gustafson, you know, she was a, you know, great player for, you know, for Iowa, um, you know, now is in the WNBA. And if I remember correctly, if I remember correctly, I don't know if they've already retired her jersey at Iowa yet. But um, but if they haven't, you know, you know, it's only a matter of time before they do. But I think they already did. But 
but yeah, I feel like that this is, I feel like that this in many ways, and I do have UConn winning this game, by the way, but I feel like in a lot of ways, this is kind of something that I think people will start thinking, okay, Iowa sort of maybe has something going here. So I think that in, you know, in coming years, I feel like people are going to start thinking, all right, you know, like I said, Iowa sort of has something here. So that's going to be like, especially, and, and, and it helps their recruiting too. So this is going to be something where people say, okay, they're building something at Iowa, kind of like they built something at Oregon, you know, around Satu Sabali and Sabrina Ionescu. So I think that this, you know, like, like I said, I think UConn is going to win this game, but I think over the next couple of years, I really think this will help Iowa. Right, right. And, um, you know, when, when you're just talking about the impact of this game, uh, I kind of can kind of liken it to on the NBA level. I know it's kind of like the basic thing, especially between us, you know, on, on our pod. Shout out to A-League Show. Shout out A-League Show. That's our podcast. Um, but, you know, Luca and Trey. <laughs> 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 of that, you know, I'm saying like a big matchup that, you know, they've kind of been compared to their entire like season, you know, at least in the women's basketball world, it's kind of been like Paige Bakers is great. And we appreciate all the publicity and attention she's bringing to the sport um, with the first network, you know, Fox network game in uh, college mm -hmm. women's basketball history and all those things that, that she does for the sport. But hey, a freshman is leading the country in scoring right now. And no one's talking about it on a major scale. Like she's not getting the same type of press that this Paige Becker's girl is getting. And it's kind of mm -hmm. been like that the entire season of, you know, is Caitlin better than uh, better than Paige, even though she doesn't get as much attention? Why doesn't Caitlin get as much attention as Paige? And it's mm -hmm. kind of the same way in the NBA where it was like, why are people talking about Luca and that Trey and, you know, yeah. stuff like that. And then even on the WNBA uh, since, you know, where, it was a nice rivalry going before, you know, Sabrina got hurt, but with Kennedy Carter and, and Sabrina Onescu of, you know, why is Kennedy not getting as much attention as Sabrina? She's a rookie averaging 20 right now. You know, both of them mm -hmm. got hurt and the thing got fizzled out. But, uh, yeah. you know, just, just how, how do you see this on the impact of women's uh, basketball and the sport? It's great. Absolutely. It's great. Like the more eyeballs, the more eyeballs to women's basketball, the better. And, you know, I was, I was about to bring up the exact same thing that you brought up, boss. I was about to bring up the exact same thing with, uh, with you know, Sabrina, Sabrina Ionescu and, uh, and Kennedy Carter. Like, you know, that, that's, that was the comparison that I was about to, you know, I was about to make. And that'll be another one of those, um, you know, storylines that will be, um, you know, that will be interesting to follow, especially as, you know, we're getting closer and closer to whenever the WNBA uh, releases their schedule. Like, whenever they release New York Liberty versus Atlanta Dream, like that's going to be, you know, one of the first games I'm going to have on my, you know, on my schedule to watch on League Pass for sure. But, but yeah, I think that the impact, like I said, you know, this game, and especially the fact that we're talking about like two freshmen, like it's, you know, it, it's, one of, it's one of those games that, like I said, is really, really, really big for the sport. And I feel like that, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those, one of those games where it could, possibly arguably be the biggest game as far as this whole tournament that's not a final four game so you know just because for sure, for sure yeah just because of you know the fact that you have the the opportunity to really highlight two you know marquee players that already have WNBA written all over them like I think that that is you know that is going to be that is going to be huge for the sport, you know, like I said, long-term going forward. Man, Kim, I appreciate you a billion times, a billion fold, all that good stuff for uh, <laughs> hopping on. Last second, I hit up Kim literally like an hour ago and I was like, hey, can you hop on Zoom to talk about basketball? But yeah, uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> you know it ready, man. Oh yeah, hey, hey, I appreciate it, brother. I appreciate it. Uh, A-League coming back soon on Swish's channel. Shout out to Swish. Yeah, uh, yeah, man. Uh, if you are mm -hmm. new to the channel, this is the Road to 2K. We're coming back. All these things, we're going to lead it up so you guys have something to watch and some appetizers leading up to this big game on Saturday. You guys take care. Be easy. Keem, let the people know where they can find you, man. 
as always, Akeem Balaam, A-K-I-E-M, B-A-I-L-U-M, Prep Girls Hoop South Carolina, Queen Ballers, and as always at Beyond the W. So check those out. Till next time. Appreciate it so much, y'all. Y'all be easy.